Well, good morning, First Free. It's good to see y'all. We kind of, we sold all the stuff here on stage, so we're just down to a couple acoustic guitars, so hope you don't mind that this morning. Just a little change up, but uh, good to see y'all. Uh, we just want to worship together. Would you stand with us? We're going to drop it a little bit old school here. If you've been around the church for any period of time, you'll recognize this song, but haven't done it in a while, but just still a favorite, just a, a song of praise, lifting up the Lord Jesus. Singing glory, glory, high. 
Christ is my firm foundation. Blue 
You may be seated. Did you all feel it when we started singing He Reigns and like everybody was singing in together? It was such a cool, powerful moment. Denny, did you feel it? It was awesome. Um, my name is Brian, one of the uh, pastors here at First Free. We are absolutely delighted um, that you are joining us today. Um, if you are new or you're kind of checking things out and you're like, hey, I'd just like to um, let somebody know that I was here. There's an opportunity to fill out an online connect card. If you look at the slide behind me, it says firstfreelincoln.org backslash new. If you go there, it um, gives you an opportunity to, to let us know um, that you're here with us. Um, go ahead and please do that if you feel like you want to. If you don't want to do that and you're like, I'd really like to still meet somebody, there is a wall called the Hello Wall, which says hello on the wall. Um, we are available um, after services, before services. If you wanna talk um, to somebody, meet a pastor, elder, or somebody on staff, we would love to shake your hand and just chat with you for a few minutes too. So if you don't wanna go online and fill your stuff out, at least come and say hi and let us know um, that you are here. One of the values that we have at First Free is that we value that we are better together. And when I think about being better together, I think of all opportunities that we get to come together like every Sunday in worship and just be together in the body of Christ. Sometimes we serve together, sometimes we learn together, um, sometimes we just get together to be reminded of God's goodness and how awesome he is and that he reigns. On April 28th, we have an opportunity to get to um, get together um, at our All Together Sunday service, which is at 10.30, only one service on April 28th, and it's a time for us to celebrate, uh, celebrate life transformation as people are getting baptized. In fact, you're sitting there, you're like, wait, you know, I've seen a couple baptisms at First Free. I'm really interested in that. It's not too late to sign up for baptism for All Together Sunday. Let us know. There's a place on the website. I can't think of what it is right now um, off the top of my head. Um, but come see me at the Hello Wall, and I'll find out that information. So if you're thinking, I'd like to be interested, there's a place that you can sign up online. Um, because we're better together, there's an opportunity for us to be together at 9 a.m. for a breakfast as well. So 9 a.m. breakfast on All Together Sunday, followed by the 1030 service, where we celebrate um, life transformation and share stories of how God is working in our lives. Couple other quick announcements. May 4th, the garage sale um, of the century is happening. Um, we will start collecting stuff next Sunday. They, I believe there'll be a table out here, um, but if not, there will be signs directing you to where you can go drop stuff off. All of the stuff that you're thinking in your house that we could get rid of, or get rid of, this is a great excuse and a great opportunity to be a blessing. That money that we raise goes to support um, our missions partnership in Mexico and primarily in sending a team down there this summer. So I highly recommend um, going out to your garage and going through your closets and cleaning out and being a blessing. Um, next Sunday, um, right after the second service, there is a ladies' luncheon. Um, it's an opportunity for, um, for women um, at First Free to come check it out. Um, they'll get to connect with women's ministry, so go ahead and put that on your calendar for next Sunday. That means, husbands, you get to go out to lunch anywhere you want. I just made that up. I'm going to tell my wife that and see if it works. Um, or better yet, we're better together. Why don't you find your buddies and go out to lunch with them while the ladies are at the luncheon? Last thing. I feel like this is a whole bunch of um, announcements. Last thing, we have study guides that go along with the um, Sermon on the Mount series, the um, Upside Down Kingdom. This is um, part two. We finished up part one, so these are brand new packets. Um, if you are interested in doing a study that supplements or goes along with the Sermon 
um, series up through the summer, um, we'd highly recommend picking this up. If you're an online person, um, you can also download this on the website as well. Um, I also discovered, too, that there's blank pages for sermon notes. Um, yes, I do have notes on here, but this is for announcements, not that I'm pre-thinking the sermon. Um, so yes, sermon note pages if you like to take notes um, as well. Whew, that was a lot. That was, that was a lot. We got it all, I think. Now somebody will remind me that I forgot something and we'll get it in second hour. So come back second hour and you might hear some different announcements. <laughs> Let me pray for you all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity uh, to be here, to be reminded, Lord, that you reign. You really do. Um, Lord, we thank you that when we come together as a church, um, that we get to do this with other people, the whole body of Christ, the family. And Lord, we, um, through all of these things coming up, let us not forget that um, our faith is not something that we live alone, but it's something that we do with our brothers and sisters in Christ. So whether it's Mexico garage sales or whether it's all together Sundays or ladies luncheons, we get the opportunity to um, celebrate you um, with one another. And Lord, we thank you for that. Lord, we just wanna thank, um, thank you right now for uh, this opportunity to worship. Pray that um, as Danny communicates that you would speak through him, um, you would challenge us, Lord, um, through the word. Um, that we would leave this place um, not as complacent followers, Lord, but people who have been challenged, who think deeply about what's being shared and that we apply it to our lives. Um, Lord, I pray, pray that would be true. And lastly, Lord, we pray for the conflict in the Middle East. Um, we know that it's uh, been going on for a long time. Um, seems like it's ramped up um, in recent months and just even in the last 24 hours. It's been a little crazy. Um, so we pray for peace in the Middle East. Um, and for things to be um, worked out. Mm -hmm. And Lord, uh, in the midst of that too, um, we just again acknowledge that we trust in you. It's in your name we pray, amen. Amen. There's so much information at our fingertips, so much, uh, and yet with all the information and knowledge that we have now with the online presence that's in our lives, there's so much more discouragement so it's more despondency, so much more just people giving up. And God's encouragement and an invitation to us is to just come, come before him and see him as the holy God that he is and the loving God that he is. So let's do that. You can stand with us.
You may be seated. that was wonderful, but you guys sound amazing. Like I get the privilege of just staying over here kind of in silence for a little bit and getting to, getting to, is that even, we're not off to a good start, but getting to listen to your voices and to think about Sometimes like, the way that I picture heaven is I picture it full of like lights and lasers and fog and this loud sound and just us praising the Lord and it being just kind of this crazy scene. And then every now and then there are just these moments where I actually think it may just be this sweet stillness of just genuine, sincere voices crying out, only a holy God. And so thank you for blessing me this morning. Thank you for that opportunity. Um, before we dig in today, uh, two things. One, if you're new, my name is Danny. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. I get the opportunity uh, to stand up here each week and talk a little bit about Jesus and his love for us. And today is no different than that. But before we get to that, um, we here believe that we are a family together. And so when Brian says we're better together and that's one of our values that we hold, we genuinely believe that. And so we also like to celebrate our family just like you would, right? If somebody in your family does something amazing or magnificent, you want to bring that up, you want to talk about that. And so just to give a little caveat, a little background uh, story, about, I don't know, probably seven, eight months ago now, um, me and Mike Rob went and had dinner with our spouses, and we were sitting there, and the whole point of that dinner was I wanted to sit down and I wanted to convince Mike to become our worship pastor. I didn't know where he was in that um, thought or that transition or that prayer. And so he opened up by, by being very humble and saying, yes, I would love to be able to do that. And so I got really, really excited. And I said, okay, when do you feel like you can make that transition? And, and he said, well, before I do, I, just, I, I have to accept it under a caveat. And I was like, what is that? And he's like, I cannot do it full time. And like, I kind of had this moment where I was like, oh, bring more chips and salsa. We, like, we're gonna be here a little bit longer, right? And he said, no, I just, I really ultimately, like, I love worshiping, I love leading the team, I want to, to have a deeper role at church, but I ultimately feel called to be a teacher at Irving Middle School. I feel called that God has not released me to that, that I want to impact kids in a way that allows them to really engage and grow in life and ultimately, hopefully, meet Jesus. He wanted to embody this value that we have, that we are sent. 
And so in typical Mike fashion, though, I got sent from a variety of you this article that was written in the Lincoln Journal that Mike won the 2024 Scottish Rite Teacher of the Year Award this week. And so in honor of him, apparently I'm bigger than a middle schooler, but I have this Irving Middle School <laughs> choir shirt on underneath. I was gonna wear it completely, but um, it was a little immodest, so we're gonna wear it underneath this shirt for now, all right? And so I just want to say thank you, Mike. Thank you for your example. Thank you for the way that you demonstrate what it actually means to live out the values of the gospel in real life, which we're gonna talk about a little bit today, all right? So if you do me a favor, grab your Bible and flip to Matthew chapter five, or you can click there. We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount, this upside down kingdom that Jesus begins to proclaim and teach, arguably his most famous teaching ever. And this week, it's gonna get real, and I'm gonna explain that in just a second, but I was struck by this quote that you may have heard before. This is from Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. He said this, some people are so heavenly minded they're of no earthly good. Some people are so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. Now what's interesting about that is, as I did some research, because you always want to figure out where are these quotes from, like who actually said them, because I don't want to be promoting somebody that actually doesn't stand for Jesus in the gospel. So here's what was really funny, is he was a philosopher, he was a scientist, but also he was a pastor's kid. So reading this, I was like, oh man, I'm, a, I'm in for it, right? Because to be so heavenly minded that they're of no earthly good. You wonder about his background, the home that he grew up in, what he experienced, and maybe you have felt that way. I've felt that way many times. That as I try to follow Jesus, as I try to read and understand scripture, as I try to grow spiritually, I somehow bought in, maybe I was taught, maybe I was discipled this way, that the closer you get to Jesus, the further removed you are from real life. That the closer you get to Jesus, the more you have to separate from real life. That the closer you get to Jesus, the more you have to get away from the world. And so there's this weird dichotomy that takes place, this false dichotomy of you're either heavenly minded, meaning you're thinking about God and heaven and the next life and you're spiritual, or you're really nuts and bolts, tangible. I thought that maybe you have thought this, I need something tangible. I want, desire, long to make a difference. I want to make an impact. I want to be of some use in my world. Whether that's as a friend, a spouse, a parent, a citizen, a teacher. And so, let's just be honest with one another for a second. Is there anyone in here that's not trying to figure out life? Like you've got it down, anyone got it down? No, and that includes me. That's why we're just all trying to do the best with what's available to us, right? We're trying to play the hand that we've been dealt. So we have a value where we say we welcome the mess because who isn't a mess? The world people in process, meaning the first free is a place, a safe place to be honest, to say I'm not okay and that's okay but it's also a place to grow in that process. It's not okay for me to stay that way. And so we use words like spiritual formation, heaven, spirituality, we talk about the kingdom of God, and they all sound beautiful and mystic, but we need and want something relatable and realistic. And that's what's unbelievable about Christianity, and specifically, if you think about it, the incarnation of Jesus. The invisible God, it tells us in Colossians 1, became flesh and dwelt among us, John 1, 14. That the kingdom of heaven is found in the Son of Man, for in Jesus all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. That he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, but he still, it says this in Hebrews, he still had to be made like his brothers and sisters in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest. And because of that, he is able to sympathize with our weaknesses, tempted in every way that we were, so that we, in our time of need, with confidence we can draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy. Think about that. The incarnation is this perfect marriage of being so heavenly minded that you're of the most earthly good. That the king of heaven 
would bring his kingdom to invade earth in Christ and through followers of Christ. The scholar N.T. Wright, he would explain the impact of the gospel this way, that the gospel is the beginning of God's new project, not to snatch people away from earth to heaven, but to colonize earth with the life of heaven. He got this thought from C.S. Lewis who said this, if you read history, you'll find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought the most of the next. And so here's what I want you to do. I want you to just take a second, close your eyes. And I want you to imagine in your mind what that would look like in our lives today. The kingdom of heaven to invade earth, to invade your world. What would that actually look like? Paint that picture in your mind. Engage your imagination for just a moment. What would the kingdom of heaven on earth look like? I thought about that question for myself this week. And I wrote it down, I, I thought, revival, breaking out everywhere. Not just like big, huge tents everywhere, but just people singing and praising and just glorifying God, that there would be this amazing revival that takes place where just everybody is doing that, that everybody would give up all their possessions, that we'd have worship bands full of angels, that like every dictatorship or just ungodly regime would be overthrown, that there'd be no need for money, that calories would never count and chips and salsa would never run out, right? It'd be amazing. But that wouldn't be in line with the incarnation either. Because when I picture heaven on earth, I picture these huge, enormous, miraculous things. But Jesus didn't bring his kingdom. He didn't enter earth with magnificence, but in a manger. Most of his life is unrecorded, uncelebrated for the first 30 years. His ministry is brief as it was breathtaking. His life is surrounded by outcasts, marginalized, ignored. He dies in the middle of two sinners, which is fitting because Jesus was always in the middle of sinners. That's what's amazing about the glorious gospel. That it's almost unglorious. It works in the mundane more than the marvelous. Making faith, a faithful mundane life a light in the dark world. The thing that most struck me about when I was reading the article about Mike, and he would never bring this up or say this, but that he began teaching in 2001 and it's 2024 that he wins an award. 23 years, day in and day out. Many of you get that. I, we have a, a church that's absolutely filled with amazing teachers. That's one of the reasons why we love LPS. That's why we love Lincoln Christian. That's why we love all the schools in the area. Because it's day in, day out, doing the little things that make the biggest difference for the glory of God. And so, what does that look like for us here this morning? Well, this morning, we're gonna look in what are called the first of six antithesis of Jesus. He gets in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount. He starts to declare, this is exactly what the kingdom will look like. He says, I've not come to abolish what's been done. I'm not coming to abolish the law and prophets, to do away with them, to delete them, to remove them, but to fulfill them, to make them complete and clear. And so for sake of reminder, we talked about this last week. What are the law and prophets? Anyone? Anyone study this week? Oh, man. oh well, job security, I guess, all right? Here, here's what they are. The law and prophets are not what we would assume. When you hear the law and prophets, we assume rules and regulations. Here are the things you do, and here are the things you don't do. Rather, what Jesus says is life, the law and prophets is about a life that represents God, that we respond to God's love for us. It's reflected in our love for everyone. It's how we conduct ourselves. It's the guide, the culture. This is what it means to be a Christian, and Jesus would sum it up this way. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and prophets. Love God, love others. But this is the righteousness that he says has to exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, the, the Bible nerds, those who had memorized the Bible. 
but their relationship with God and with others was off. To be righteous actually means to be in right relationship with God, other people, and all of creation. And so Jesus picks out six ways. And we're gonna look at those over the next few weeks. And so this morning, we look at the first, which is gonna be interesting. And so I just wanna say this, I wanna give us a moment. Because when I say Jesus is about to get real, I think for many of us, we say we want something tangible, and then when Jesus starts to give us something tangible, we go, ooh, that kind of steps on my toes. That's a little too close for comfort. And so, if we wanna be raw, if we wanna be vulnerable, we're probably gonna feel exposed, even ironically, given today, you may even become angry this morning. So before we read the text, before we dive in, I think we need to take a moment and just prepare our hearts. So this is what I like to do. If you would just take a moment, close your eyes, and wherever you're at in your walk with Jesus, if you don't have a walk with Jesus, that you're in here this morning and you're just going, I'm curious and I'm wondering and I want to hear actually what Jesus had to say, that you would just can confess that, that you would just be open and say, okay, let's find out if you're real. But for many of us, I think maybe we've been going to church for so long that our hearts have become callous and we think we already know what we're going to hear. And so let's just take a moment of silence and ask God, soften my heart. Help me to be brave enough to be honest, to be vulnerable, just between me and you, God. And then we'll dive in. Was that my signal? I was supposed to stop the moment of silence. We'll go with it, all right? Matthew 5, 21 through 26. The words will be on the screen if you want to follow along. It says this. Jesus says, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that anyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to counsel, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go first and be reconciled to your brother. And then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you'll be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get, around, get, oh, get out until you have paid your last penny. Something that we want to regularly practice here as part of our, what we call spiritual formation, the process of being formed into the image of Christ, is we want to ask and learn, what did Jesus do? What is he asking his followers to do? And then we want to practice obedience. And so what is Jesus teaching us? That process is hard. The process includes this personal commitment to regularly and intentionally follow Jesus. And so this morning, we're going to have that exact opportunity. So we're going to do a quick survey real quick. Jesus says this, you've heard it said to those who are, who are of old, you shall not murder. Whoever murders will be liable to judgment. And so let's just do a quick survey. Anyone fail that test this morning? Nobody murdered anybody this week. Man, we're off to a great start. We're also a holy church, all right? And so check, got that good to go. But if you notice, he digs just a little bit deeper. He exposes real life, this felt emotion of anger. So we can do this question. How many of you have felt angry this morning? Okay, a few of you. This is like last week. Oh, I'm in. I'm supposed to confront you about this. Last week I asked, anybody in here struggle with reading scripture? In this service, nobody raised their hand. 1030, 75% of the service raised their hand. They're far more honest than you are, all right? 
So some of you, like, you got angry driving today. Like, they were swerving in front of you. They cut you off. Yesterday, I was talking with Noah on the way to a baseball game. I cut somebody off, and they proceeded to say hello to me for the next five minutes down the road with their horn, right? They were very upset. They got even more mad when they passed me, and I waved. <laughs> All right? So you got angry, like, driving today. You got angry at the timing of somebody not getting dressed in time, not finding their shoes in time, because no kid can find their shoes when you actually need them to, right? Like there's all these things that we get angry about. That's just this morning. How many of you got angry yesterday? Oh, a few more hands. Angry this week. All right, now we're getting a little bit more honest, okay? Remember, we welcome the mess. Here's something we need to eliminate as we listen. He focuses on the emotion of anger, the freedom by which we use to label and degrade people. He talks about cursing them and dehumanizing them, but let's eliminate two things. One, Jesus is not initiating a new rule or restriction. This isn't new. And Jesus is not intensifying the old law. Jesus is exposing the intent of the law. Remember, we've said this over and over again. Jesus is obsessed with our hearts. The one who knows every thought, every word, every motive, every feeling that we have, that there is no way that you can surprise Jesus. So we can ask in this room for a raise of hands, and whether you raise them or not, God knows your heart. It's one of the reasons why I ask myself honestly, who am I fooling? And so Jesus is not exhorting his disciples to observe a law, do not murder, but to obey the command, love your neighbor as yourself. This is what that actually looks like. Because it's easy not to murder people, right? Here's the easiest way not to murder people. Don't be around people. Like that's pretty simple, right? Anybody have that life? No, if you're in this room, you're around people, right? And so, loving people is hard because people are human and humans hurt humans. I mean, we could get real and I could ask you to raise your hands. How many of you have been hurt by another human? Right? I mean, they're maybe even sitting in the pew with you. They may ride home with you. You may have grown up with them. You may work with them. You may play sports with them. You may have to travel with them. Like, Humans hurt other humans, and that's what's so beautiful and raw about Scripture, is it's not idealistic, it's realistic. What are we to do when other humans get in our way? Well, typically, we have two responses. Number one, we fight. Aggression, anger, obviously Jesus is saying that's not the way to go. That's not the kingdom of heaven. And so he, he'll tell us just in a couple of weeks we're going to get into this. He'll say if somebody hits you on one cheek, turn and give them the other. So fighting clearly isn't the way of Jesus. So there's the second way, the one that I think is maybe even more destructive. We flee, which means we avoid. We fawn, which means we acquiesce. We faint, which means we act obtuse, like it's not really happening. And that's the path that most Christians are exhorted to take. That that's what you need to practice. In fact, a study came out in The Guardian this week that the way most often to deal with anger is that if you take your anger, you write down what you're angry about on a sheet of paper, and you put it through a shredder, your anger will dissipate, go away. My, like, that's as simple as this is. Everybody today buy a shredder. How many of you believe that's true? Okay, I got the headline, and I'm like, this totally is gonna destroy my sermon. So I start reading through it. Do you know how intensive this study is? They took 50 people. 50. And only, only 20 of them used the shredder. Like, I found myself angry at the study about anger, right? So, Christians, we're exhorted this way. You're not angry. Because anger is sin, right? And so our lives look a little bit like this clip, if you'd watch this real quick.
where you just push it down deep, deep, deep inside. Because the further you push it down, the more you suppress it, it'll eventually go away, right? Except it's like trying to hold a beach ball underneath the water. Eventually, it comes up and it explodes. And so if our options are fight, flight, fall, and faint, we talked about this a few weeks ago, our only alternative is to faithfully love. Now, you may have just heard Unikitty again, right? But this is different, and here's how it's different. Dallas Willard said this, anything you can do with anger, you can do better without it. Anything you can do with anger, you can do better without it. And so this is so important to Jesus that check out, listen to what he says. If you're in here and you're a follower, verse 23. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. To Jesus, the fractured relationship is more important than some holy ritual. Like, think about that for a second to the culture that Jesus is speaking to, to the crowd that's gathered to us in this room. Many of us are willing to tolerate, to suppress, to hold down deep inside these feelings of anger, the ruptured relationships, the disagreements, the things that cause us to look at the other person next to us and roll our eyes because we have to go to church. And Jesus says, hold up, wait. Like I thought about this, like when we talk about the kingdom of heaven coming to earth, what would that look like? I genuinely wonder if this room would actually be empty because everybody would be so busy trying to track down their brother or sister in Christ to reconcile before they could come offer their gift. But then to think about when that gift did finally come, how beautiful would that be? Neuroscientists who study the brain are actually finding this, that those relationships that engage in conflict and find healing, that your brain is actually stronger. It grows as a result. So any of you in here that are looking for an anger management technique, there you go, right? Reconciliation is not ignoring the conflict. It's actually engaging another human being. It's not ignoring conflict, it's engaging another human being. Now, to clear the air, this isn't easy. In fact, I would argue it's hard and it's most often painful. I mean, think about it. why don't we do it? I mean, at minimum, it's awkward. Then it's hard. Then for many of us in here, it's painful. Somebody hurt you to the point that you're angry at them. Like, our emotions are part of our life. Our emotions are indicators. Our emotions tell us something is off, something is not right, and anger is no different. Anger is a response to hurt, to betrayal, to pain. Jesus doesn't say you have no reason to be angry. He says here's how we process our anger. Here's what we do with it. Disclaimer. There's a difference between anger and abuse. One of the failures of the church historically, I think, is not to separate those two things. They're fundamentally different. Some of you have been abused physically, sexually. Some of you have had traumatic experiences. You've been emotionally or mentally battered. This isn't speaking to that. This isn't go and be reconciled then. Act like it never happened. There's an entirely different course of action with that. One that involves counseling, one that involves finding safety, one that involves getting healing, first and foremost. What Jesus is addressing here is sin's impact on humanity in general. 
Because the goal of sin is always separation and ultimately death. Death to you as a human, death to your relationship. It separates us, it divides us. But what sin separates, God reconciles. That's what Paul says in Colossians 1, 21 through 22, is he says that Jesus, Jesus, it's through him that all things are reconciled to one another. That we come together and so the fuel for our reconciliation becomes not who did what and who did what worse. Like I've got four kiddos, three of which are teenagers. Trust me, that's a lot of conversation around our dinner table. But this is what I know about humanity in general. We never grow out of that. We just get more sophisticated. Because do you know that every single one of us in here believes we would be perfect and holy if it wasn't for so-and-so who did whatever to us, right? All of my sin is just a response to them. That's exactly what Adam did. God's like, did you eat the apple? And he's like, God, listen, I'm on your team. But Eve over there, she's the devil incarnate, right? Forget that she's bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and I am so grateful for her because I needed her because it's not good for man to be alone, but actually, God, we should probably do something about her. Like, that's the posture that we most often take. I'm responsible for my response, always. Because ultimately, I'm not responding to you, I'm responding to Christ. Christ, who when he hung on a cross, and we don't talk about this a lot, said, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This may blow your mind, but I think most often the way that we hurt one another is not intentional. We don't even know what we're doing. We've been trained, conditioned, discipled, if you will, to get ahead, to fight, to claw, to compete. And for me to come up, you have to go down. That's why it's an upside down kingdom. As we examine, am I being discipled by the world or am I being discipled as a citizen in the kingdom of heaven? Because reconciliation is the beginning of restoration. It's God's kingdom invading the kingdom of earth. So close your eyes again. And imagine for a moment what a pursuit of restoration and healing would look like in a world of division and hatred. Where the church was the least divided and the most united. Where the church was where you went to work out conflict, not avoid conflict. Where the church that says, I've been separated from God by sin but God, in his infinite mercy and great wisdom and love for me, has reconciled to me. When I was dead in my trespasses, when I was weak and unable to help myself, God came for me. And so because God's come for me, I will be with you. I think that looks like a revolution that looks like a revolution that leads to a revival and a renewing, not of our country, but of a kingdom. Because this isn't about the good old days. This is a glimpse of the days to come when there is no division, there is no pain. And so rather than giving you something to go and necessarily do, I want to ask you some questions and maybe give you some space to sit in them for a moment. One, where is your anger? Where is it and how are you processing it? Are you processing it? Like one of the best questions I've ever been asked by a counselor is, why are you mad? Like, why are you really mad? That's how I figured out I was a control freak. Most often the thing that made me most angry is when things weren't done the way I thought they should be done said the way I thought they should be said. So what really, why are you angry? Number two, who are you angry at? Who are you angry at? God? Others? Another way to put the question, who is it that you need to go to, like Jesus says? For 
some of us, I think it is God. Like if you were being really honest, you feel like God has not kept up his end of the bargain. He's let you down, right? Life has not been what you thought it would be. Marriage hasn't, kids haven't, job hasn't, life hasn't, like you thought it would be something else and so you're angry at him. Or who's the human? And like they popped into your mind. This is the person I'm mad at. This is the people I'm mad at. Another way to put it maybe, who do you fear the most? Let me tell you this. When I say, who do you need to go to, maybe the first place to stop is a godly counselor. Please don't ignore that. And when we say we welcome the mess, if you wanna know what that mess looks like, literally in March, Pastor Mark did a three-week series on Wednesday nights, just on anger, on bitterness, on anxiety, on all these different things, and over 100 people every single Wednesday night gathered in that room. So if you think, I'm the only one mad, I'm the only one anxious, I'm the only one struggling, I'm the only one in pain, I'm the only one, I promise you, you're not. In fact, if we were a little bit closer in here, I would have you look at the person next to you and say, you're not the only one. Because it's everyone. Every single one. The life of a follower of Christ is a messy life. That's why we're a people in process being formed into the image of Jesus. This is not night and day. Remember, we learn what Jesus did, we learn what he asked us to do, but then we use this phrase very specifically, we practice obedience. We practice it. Sometimes we will fail. Sometimes there'll be a Sunday like this morning where you go, you know what, I'm gonna do it, I'm going to him. And then sometimes there will be days that you go, not today, Jesus. The thing about being a Christian is, the difference between being a Christian and being a non-Christian is both people fall seven times. But the Christian gets up eight. The Christian goes back to Jesus' loving arms eight times. It's why Jesus says, come to me, all you who are winning in life. Right? No, he says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. All of you that are struggling, all of you that need, because I've come for the sick, not the well. Eugene Peterson put it this way. Jesus' teaching does not present us with a moral code and tell us to live up to this, nor does it set out a system of doctrine and say, think like this and you will live well. Rather, the biblical way is to tell a story and then the telling invite. Live into this. This is what it looks like to be human in the God-made and God-ruled world. This is what is involved in becoming and maturing as a human being and a follower of Jesus. We're learning to live in to this. So, I made an ask of you at the beginning to close your eyes and to simply pray, God, soften and open my heart. And so we're gonna have just a little moment of silence before the band leads us in a song. But I'm gonna ask you to do that same thing, to close your eyes. And now whatever has been laid on your heart, whatever name, whatever emotion, whatever feeling, Bring that to the Lord. And maybe it means you do need to grab the hand of the person next to you and say, pray with me. Maybe that means you do want to come down front and have somebody pray with you or you want to go in the back or if you want to leak out to our prayer room and fall back in there, there'll be people ready and willing to pray with you. But the worst thing you could do is have something laid on your heart and try to tuck it back down deep inside. Healing is a long process, but it has to start somewhere, and why not start today? So after just a moment or two, we'll sing together. 
but bring that before the Lord. from 
the inside out have been washed from the inside out I heard it said one time that Christians should be the least angry people. Maybe. But I think being a Christian doesn't mean you're maybe the least angry people. It just means that we know where to go with our anger. That we have a Savior that sympathizes with that, that knows what it is to be angry, that knows what it is to be broken and hurt and betrayed. So come to me, all you who are weary, heavy laden, and anger, angry. Don't teach yourself, disciple yourself how to tuck that away. Teach yourself how to bring that to Jesus. And that's what it means to bring the kingdom of heaven on earth. He is able and we are sent. Have a blessed Sunday.